when you're selling, you think the the ultimate goal is to, to sell your product. And, and at the end of the day, from a company standpoint, it, it kind of is. But we think that the way to do that is by convincing everyone how great our product is. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what you're selling. If it's a car or a software, uh, what you really discover, and I talked about learning much of, of becoming a professional when I, when I was at Salesforce, um, you learn that really the, the way to sell is, is by not selling much at all and for genuinely being curious and asking questions about what people are struggling with. Uh, and ultimately, if you have something that can help them solve that problem or pain point or, or help them reach new levels, then great. We have alignment here. But the only way to know those things is by asking questions and, and being genuinely interested in their answers. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Or all of them. Why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. Kevin, my man, thank you for joining us on Reveal. Fantastic to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, I want to get started on this LinkedIn bio quote that I pulled from you because I did such fantastic research. I started like all salespeople do and went right to your LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, so here's the quote. In business as in life, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. What does that quote mean to you? I like it, but I'm curious why mm. you put it there. You know, it's funny. Some people take it as a, a sort of a, a sly, smooth talking kind of idea. But really, I think it's just that we hear so much nowadays about people struggling with things like imposter syndrome. Uh, meaning they don't know necessarily that they deserve to be in the role or the position or the status in life that they are. Uh, and I would argue that that's nonsense because, uh, as we well know, you are your fiercest advocate. So where you are in life is often a direct result of your actions and what you have uh, evangelized and, and sort of materialized for yourself. I'm a huge believer in this stuff uh, and the idea of blazing your own trail. Uh, and, and pursuing your own happiness. So to me, uh, if you're dissatisfied where you are, uh, shoot for something else. This isn't a novel concept. Um, and we talk all the time about job requirements and entry-level jobs want three years of experience and all that stuff. And, and, and these, are, these are concepts like anything else. So for me, where you are in life is, a, is something you are in control of. And I think it's important that we, we tell ourselves that. So uh, the quote being, you get what you negotiate, is not only uh, reflective of the business world, but your personal life and things like that. So uh, that's why I keep that as my, my LinkedIn headline, because it's a good reminder for, for everyone else and myself. I like it. That's so good. I love that. Taking your, your career, your life in your own hands and not just settling. Um, it's so important. So tell us a little bit about yourself and metadata. What problem does metadata solve and what's your role in that? Yeah, my, uh, my role is, is several. We'll start with what metadata does. Uh, at its simplest form, metadata adds predictability to demand generation. Um, and in, in doing so, helps you get to revenue faster. You're both marketers. Uh, at the end of the day, Clicks and leads and engagement and all that stuff is great, but the, the end goal is to drive revenue for the company. Uh, I would argue more so now than ever. So uh, metadata's goal is to uh, help you better target both your, your target accounts and, and your target contacts within, um, and then run an experimentation model that enables you to understand what type of content your audience is craving and what they're responding to, and in doing so, allow you to optimize uh, your ad budgets and things like that towards the ads and the creatives and the copies that are producing revenue and not just producing things like clicks and ebook downloads. Uh, we're getting towards that, you know, ungated world and all that stuff. And so it's important, maybe more so now than ever, just to understand what really is working uh, and then act accordingly. You know, you asked uh, a little bit about me as well. So I, I covered a lot of the, the typical stops in Chicago software. So uh, I spent some time at Groupon early on, just missed the IPO. So poor planning on my part. Uh, went to Salesforce after that, uh, which is just a, a wonderful place to be and where I really kind of credit 
learning how to become like a sales professional and not just a, a salesman, if you will. So um, after that, I spent a little bit of time at a small agency type shop before going to G2, um, where I started as an individual contributor and then ended up scaling our uh, SMB, we call it the growth segment, uh, from a team of three to a team of 14, when ultimately I, I left to come to metadata. And you may have noticed, Devin, you said you were poking around LinkedIn. Uh, most of our go-to-market team uh, actually came from G2. And, and there's a, a lot of story behind it. Just briefly, uh, I'll share that our marketing team at G2 started using metadata and, and couldn't speak highly enough about it. We realized that this tool could help a lot of our customers at G2 particularly in terms of operationalizing their buyer intent data, which is a, a super popular thing right now. Um, so G2 tried to acquire the company. Uh, they unfortunately turned us down. Well, fortunately for me, because then we all came here uh, and have been growing this place ever since. So that was my trajectory. I've been in just about every sales role you can imagine and uh, selling things like uh, uh, financial products to, to CRM and now to uh, MarTech. It's great. Uh, really great companies. And that Chicago Tech Hub is really unique. Um, it is really tight knit. And shout out to Sales Assembly, too, who's doing like a lot of great work in the Chicago tech space. Yeah. They've gotten to you, too, huh? Matt Green is everywhere. He's, yeah. Yeah. He sure has. He sure has. <laughs> Well, Ken, when we met and we were chatting about what we should talk about for the interview, something that jumped up for you is like something you're passionate about is, you know, bringing the customer voice into sales. So I'd love to just start with like, what does that mean to you? And why is that so important? It's funny. Uh, when you're selling, you think the, the ultimate goal is to, to sell your product. And, and at the end of the day, from a company standpoint, it, it kind of is, but we think that the way to do that is by convincing everyone how great our product is. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what you're selling, if it's a car or a software, uh, what you really discover, and I talked about learning much of, of becoming a professional when I, when I was at Salesforce, um, you learn that really the, the way to sell is, is by not selling much at all. And for genuinely being curious and asking questions about what people are struggling with, and ultimately, if you have something that can help them solve that problem or pain point or, or help them reach new levels, then great. We have alignment here. But the only way to know those things is by asking questions and, and being genuinely interested in their answers. Now, as a sales manager, I'm curious, like, are there specific strategies you use to best listen to that customer voice and be in tune with what the customer wants and needs? Yeah, uh, everyone is partial to certain sales methodologies and, and you ask a really good question because it's probably going to be different for a lot of people. For me, uh, I tend to gravitate towards what is considered like Sandler sales and, and not because I think it's necessarily better than any other as much as it is, it helped me really understand how to ask questions. So in terms of strategies, there's this concept of like peeling the onion, right? Whatever they tell you uh, they want or they need really isn't necessarily the uh, the root cause at the end of the day. So I think of things like, uh, you know, I sell MarTech, people saying we need more leads. Well, great. What does that really mean? Or uh, from Gong standpoint, like we, we want to uh, be able to listen to our, our reps conversation. Well, why? Did you miss your number? Uh, uh, are we trying to scale the team and looking for, for the right kind of people who would do well in this role? There's always a second layer of information when you ask questions and, and when you're selling, it's crucially important to get to that second layer to really understand what people are trying to accomplish. Somebody tells me I'm a, I want more leads and I respond with, great, we can do that. You might get lucky once in a while and, and sell a product, but they're not going to necessarily even understand why they're using it or, or, or why you can help them until you help them understand what really we can accomplish for them. And uh, sometimes it comes down to the customer doesn't necessarily even know what they don't know yet. So the good salespeople listening to the customer voice, I think, are those who are asking questions to to help uncover. Uh, and, and that, to me, is customer voice. It's not it's not uh, them saying the right buzzwords so you can jump in and get those happy ears and say, OK, great, we can do that. It's, it's more preventing product vomit, just going in and saying, metadata does X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, everything's a cookie cutter conversation, right? You just have the same demo every single time, no matter who you're talking to and what you're doing. So the goal of listening to the customer voice is just to ensure that you're tailoring 
a solution to them. Uh, and I think the way to do so is by asking the right questions. I, I love that, Kevin. And I've uh, learned that at Gong, which was a lot of times sales leaders say, we want to coach better. I want to improve our coaching. And it's easy to go, great. That's one of our three value pillars. I'm glad I have a, a hit here in two minutes into our discovery call. Uh, but you learn to dig deeper, right? Which is, what are you trying to coach? Oh, well, I want to make sure that we're uh, you know, using the demo, our demos more effective. Oh, okay, what are you demoing? Oh, there's actually a new product that we're, trying, that we're going to market with. Oh, okay, so now I know there's probably a CEO slide that says this year, this quarter, we need to sell X amount of dollars of this new product. So now coaching becomes a strategic uh, value add, right? And something to, something to lean on. How do you instill that with your reps, right? Like how do you go from, hey, don't, don't bite on that surface level, go at level two, three, four deeper and really get to that impact? You know, Devin, one of the things that we talked about uh, in an earlier conversation is some of the data that I look to uh, when trying to figure this stuff out. And I, I really had an epiphany one time when I was using Gong as an individual contributor because they track all these really cool stats and I'm not just trying to plug Gong, uh, although I will if you pay me enough. Uh, some of the, the data that you track, it really, you, you don't immediately think of these things as uh, important or, or you know valuable long term. But when I saw uh, a little data point and they're talking about the pause, meaning the, the duration of time between your prospect or customer or whomever, when they stop talking and when you start talking. And I noticed that just slight variations of that ultimately started altering conversations. Uh, I really started focusing in on this and tracking it on every call. So bringing it back to your question, um, for me, it's to, to wait before you jump in. Because oftentimes these people are still thinking through their own answers. And if they finish their sentence and we rush to start our next sentence, we're missing a lot of valuable information. And it's not just words, right? Uh, part of, of active listening is listening for things like tonality. Um, and, and we have the benefit nowadays of, of being on video most often. And you can see things like body language or, or you'll see somebody shift back in their chair and kind of exhale right. and you see that you're getting somewhere. And, and when we don't understand data points, which, which luckily we can track all of these things down to data. When we don't understand things like the amount of time you wait before you start talking, we lose out on so much. Um, so to, to your original question, what, what I instill is don't rush. Don't, don't rush to answer. Don't rush to capitalize. If you think you're, you, know, you have an opening here, let them finish their thoughts because I can assure you whatever it is that they say is going to be far more important than what you say next. I love that. I love that. Well, I think, you know, you talked about video, you talked about gong, like there's all this technology now to help understand what, you know, the voice of the customer um, to help managers understand when they can and should maybe step in to guide, uh, you know, somebody on their team. So I'm curious, like, at what point do you think like it's OK as a manager to step in? on a live call or after the fact, like what are some of those guardrails that you have for yourself? Boy, that's a good question. Um, the team that I was leading at G2 was a young team, uh, people with between one and four years of sales experience. So your, your natural inclination is to always sort of be there, be like the helicopter parent where you wanna make sure they don't get hurt. Uh, the reality is that sometimes you know, speaking of keeping on the kid theme, uh, sometimes you got to let the kid touch the hot stove to figure out that, that they shouldn't do that anymore. Um, so I think it's a hard question, right? Because it's going to be unique for every deal, every rep. I think part of it is knowing each of your reps individually, um, asking them things like, how do they like to be coached or, uh, or getting an understanding for, for, how they communicate so you can sense if they're starting to, to slip or, or they're a little bit lost. So uh, you certainly want to let them have those moments that are kind of sink or swim. Uh, let them figure it out for themselves or else they're going to be reliant on, on people going forward. As a leader, you also have to think about the revenue, right? You have to consider, is it worth losing this deal because I'm trying to let someone be autonomous? 
Um, or are they just kind of throwing stuff against a wall, hoping something will stick? In which case, of course, you want to help things get back on track. So um, over time, you start to recognize these patterns and you start to realize um, areas where you can be a little bit more assertive, perhaps, in these conversations, particularly, Sheena, when, when you're on a live call. Um, if, if the conversation is all over the place, you can help bring things back in. Um, if you're listening to calls and you notice that your, your reps are frequently running out of time before they get through everything, like next steps and so on, um, one of the things you can coach is, is keeping structure of the call, letting them know in, in the beginning, hey, here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, we'll save X amount of time at the end to, to discuss what comes next. Um, get their buy-in on that, this idea of like an upfront contract. So you're both aligned in this. Um, and once you master that, the idea of jumping in and, and not should become less significant, but uh, certainly always there. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Um, and I was going to say, uh, that's definitely a trend that we have, that we've heard on this show is the best managers are the ones that take some of that time. They're investing to learn about the people on their team. It's not just about like what works for you as the manager and like, how do you want to work? But how does somebody themselves learn and how do they want to be coached? So I, you know, I think taking that time to really understand each, the nuances of the folks on your team is something that's going to be so appreciated in the long run. Uh, by every single person on your team. Sheena, you bring up such a good point. Uh, I found as I was having more of these conversations, and, and I can assure you uh, it took me far too long to start having those conversations. Yeah. I figured, hey, I've been selling for a long time. You haven't. Listen to me uh, and everything will be fine. And of course, that's not how the world works. So uh, when I did start having these conversations, it's like we talked about with the customer, how you have to sort of wait to, to offer your opinion until they've really finished giving theirs. And, and to your point, um, so many people tell you that they want the direct feedback. They want you to tell them every time they're doing something wrong so they can fix it. And the reality is they, that's not necessarily true. It doesn't mean they don't want it. It just means maybe they're, that's not how they're best equipped to receive information or uh, they, they like the idea in their head more so in, in practice. So all of this stuff goes back to this, the voice, right? Hearing what's really underneath and, and peeling this onion of your reps or your prospects and so on. Well, yeah, and there's a difference between I want direct feedback all the time and I only want direct feedback, right? Because a lot of times right. it's constructive and even the best delivered constructive feedback <laughs> After eight or nine times, you're like, can I just get like a good job? Can I just get like a, you know, <laughs> like, can I get a, throw an boy my way once in a while? Know, can Kevin just comment my call? No notes. Well done, Devin. Like just one time, you know, so it, it is about, it is about balancing that for sure. Kevin, as you've listened to calls and you start to hear the next level from buyers, like not the surface level pain, but like what's truly matters to them. Has there ever been anything that like surprised you or caught you off guard? And maybe, th and, and then therefore kind of shifted the way that you view, you know, pitching or coaching your reps. Yeah. Uh, this has stuck with me for a long time. This happened when I was at Salesforce. Uh, so that was six, seven years ago now. Um, and I remember the conversation vividly to this day. And it's not so much like a, uh, a software thing or a sales thing as much as it is that you start to realize that this stuff matters to, to the human. Not, not the prospect, not the marketer. Um, so when you, know, when, you, when you learn something new, you're often really anxious to put it into practice and so on. So I was really hammering these next level questions in the Sandler stuff. And uh, there's three different levels of questioning. There's sort of the surface level, there's the, the level two, which is like, what makes you bring that up or what makes you ask? And then the third is like, how is this affecting you personally? Uh, so I got to that third level question, which is hard to do, especially in a, a cold relationship. And uh, I had somebody tell me that if they uh, if they were to meet their goal for this quarter, they knew that they had enough money set aside to put their daughter through college. And it was a moment of we're no longer talking about software. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's important to to remember for most of our products, uh, we're not curing cancer. Doesn't mean what we do is not important, but there are real life issues and people and and situations going on behind the scenes, and and all of these things do impact our lives and our jobs, which are such a big part of our lives. So when you're having these conversations, to your to your uh, question, Devin, you start to hear people uh, people's emotions come through, 
um, and you hear them answer questions in such a way that you can tell there's more to it. Um, and when you really get comfortable asking questions, and, and by comfort, I don't mean really good at, at shucking and jiving and, and reading a script. What I mean is really good in the sense of having a conversation and not a, a, a discovery or an interrogation. Um, you start to, to see opportunities to pause and go, hold on, I heard a little reservation there. Can, can you tell me more about that? You only learn those things by, by hearing them frequently. And I'll give you another plug. Um, it's very hard to hear on the fly. So when you go back and listen to call recordings and you start to hear a shift that you may not have, have heard in the midst of the conversation, you recognize, hey, uh, ensure that you're leaving space in these conversations to let people shine through and, and to make this not just a business dialogue, but they're here to solve a problem. If they solve this problem, it impacts their personal life. Similarly, as a salesperson, look, Nobody's, uh, nobody thinks that salespeople don't do this, at least in part for the money. So sure, salespeople get tied emotionally to deals and things like that. So does everybody else. Everybody else has a reason for what they're doing and, and ensuring that we leave space in these conversations to hear that is, is paramount. It's funny you said that. I was, I was just going to say this anecdote, but, but you beat me to it, was in the call, in the moment, it feels like the world's moving really fast, right? You're you just like, want to say the right thing. You're like trying to listen. You're trying to process. You want to say either your script or like this messaging, you know, that works. When you listen to it on a call, and this is when I started using Gone For Myself again as an IC, was like <clears throat> almost like watching a movie. Like I'm a big Quentin Tarantino fan, right? So the dialogue always means oh, oh, there we go. The, the reveal. Surprise. The reveal is nice. <laughs> <laughs> the big reveal. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, I'll restart and we'll keep that for the video, the video version. All right. Um, no, what, what I was going to say, Kevin, you beat me to it was uh, when you're on the call, the world's moving really fast, right? You're trying to process information. You're trying to listen. You want to think of the next right thing to say. And so you miss those little cues that you just mentioned. But when you listen back to calls, either your own or you're coaching somebody else, it's kind of like watching a movie. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big Quentin Tarantino fan. So, you know, there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of pausing and a lot of meaning in there. And you can really pick up on those things. And that's what was helpful for me was like, oh, there's these tone shifts. There's these pauses that I didn't get in the moment. Next time I'm on a call, I'm going to be more mindful of those things. And when I hear them, when I sense them, I'm going to pause and kind of react differently. You really nailed it, Devin, when you said, uh, I want to make sure I say the right thing and uh, that's such a, and I know what you meant, and, and you're exactly yeah. right. I think that's such a, a common mistake that we as salespeople make, which is that we believe we know the direction the call should go. Of course. And in doing so, if you go into the call with sort of a premeditated talk track and a premeditated direction, you're not leaving that opportunity to find out what's really going on. We, we keep, you know, uh, in sales leadership, you keep lists of, of engaging questions that are helpful to ask. And, and oftentimes, particularly new reps will take five or six of those, and they are going to hammer those questions on every single call based on the personas and all this stuff. And that prep work is great. But what you're doing when you do those things is you are predetermining where that call is going to go. Uh, to, to your point about uh, going back and listening to it, if you listen to three, four, five of the calls that you use those questions on, you're going to hear that they go the exact same way. The, the goal should be, once you identify that, knock it off. Uh, this is 2021. We're not hammering sales scripts anymore and banging out dials. These are human interactions. And there's a reason we keep our videos on now. It's because we're, we're, we're getting more interpersonal in our, our interactions. So, um, going back and listening to these conversations, first of all, I think it's so understated that it allows you to actually have a conversation like we are right now. If, if I was trying to sell you, Devin, which I might after this, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm asking you questions and I'm scribbling down notes. There's not a chance that I'm going to hear those little nuances and, and tone shifts yeah. and things like that as I'm frantically writing down what I think are the important takeaways here. So something... Uh, like a gong enables you to have a human interaction, a human conversation, and then go back and figure out, hey, what are the areas uh, uh, that they're looking for some help in? What are the areas that we can do uh, to to help them towards those goals? Yeah, I called it infinite memory. 
when I'm using Gong. I, I can go back and look at those, look at the recordings and, and, and search things instead of writing things down, even though now you are giving me good takeaways. So forgive me for if you see me scribbling on my notepad. <laughs> yeah. Compliment. So Kevin, we talked about a couple pitfalls like that folks deal with if they're disconnected from their customer voice. So, you know, not getting to that like deepest personal pain, not being able to connect emotionally, um, you know, too focused on their own script and their own agenda versus what the customer cares about. Like what else? Is there anything else that we missed? Like if you are not close to your customer's voice? Well, I think there, uh, there comes into to play some predictability, right? Uh, sales is, I often equate it to like a high school chemistry class or science class where um, everything has a process a control and a variable. And in doing so, it enables you to figure out what is is causing change or affecting change and things like that. So uh, I think one of the pitfalls that salespeople and, and even sales leaders have is kind of winging it. And I know that that flies in the face a bit of what I said before about not predetermining where calls are going to go, but writing a script is not what I mean by saying having a defined process. So I think a pitfall is not following at least a structured sales cycle, uh, an evaluation plan, whatever you want to call it. And that requires mutual buy-in, right? Who cares what I think or how I think this should go? If, if that's not how the customer wants to buy or their, their company generally makes purchases. So uh, in, in running this experimentation that is sales, we have to have that control involved or else we're never going to know why things are getting off. What is the variable that is making our deals go off track in stage four? We run a great discovery call. We had a wonderful product demo and then people are going dark. Well, why is this? Well, we only know that if the first and second conversations are generally going similarly. So Gina, uh, the pitfall is guessing, right? The, is, is, trying to wing it when we know we have a hundred years of data. Todd Capone, brought up sales assembly. I'm a huge fan of Todd Capone and the transparency sale. And he always shares sales wisdoms from a hundred years ago. They're really cool. Uh, if you're a nerd for that stuff like me. Um, and it, it's a consistent theme, right? Uh, of, of salespeople. Uh, we think we know everything. We love hearing ourselves talk. And, and oftentimes we let that shine through and we, we lose track of the process and then we lose deals and we get to forecast time and we go, yeah, I feel really good about this one. And they go, okay, what's next? And you go, uh, I'm going to follow up with Steve next week, probably. Uh, all right. Well, we've been doing this long enough to know how that generally ends. Getting close to reality. That's what we're all about. All right, Kevin, there's one question that we ask every single guest on reveal. You would only know it if you've listened to the end of an episode of Reveal because I don't put it in the notes. I don't let you prep for it. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. How would you describe sales in one word? Oh, boy. Do I want to give a, a funny answer, a, a practical answer here? What was the first thing that uh, came yeah. to your mind? I'll let you change it, but I'm, now I'm curious what the first thing was. It was like a funny, clever... <laughs> the first thing that... The first thing that came into my head was the word persuasion, but I didn't jump out and say it because it has sort of a negative connotation, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is we're we're transferring beliefs and all those like technical uh, ways of thinking about this. But persuasion is everywhere in life. Sales is everywhere in life. So for me, the word is persuasion, uh, persuading you that my way of doing things is better for you than your way of doing things. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. I like it. And yeah. I agree that persuasion has a negative connotation, but I don't think that it should. Manipulation is its like ugly cousin. Mm -hmm. If you persuade people yep. for yep. a bad cause, it's terrible. But if you persuade people for a benefit of their own, if you've uncovered the pain like you've talked about. Now I'm persuading you that you want to go towards this desired state. Makes a great salesperson. Especially in high tech, you're, you're often educating about what, a new way of doing things. Um, so you, you have to educate and advocate and persuade on this new, this new form, this thing that you truly believe in that they may not be aware of as yet. It's a really good point, Sheena. If you think about literal education, isn't that really a, a, a passing along of oh, beliefs, yeah. a persuasion? Yeah. Um, this information is relevant and, uh, and important to you. So yeah, I, I think you nailed it. 
Well, Kevin, it has been so fun having you on the show. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we Likewise. really, really appreciate it. Woo!